Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to the July 2023 Hyperledger Foundation Financial Markets Mortgage Subgroup Meeting. Before we get started, I'd like to express our appreciation to the Financial Markets Special Interest Group and the Hyperledger Foundation. I always do this at the beginning because we are very appreciative of their ongoing support in making this group possible. Okay, as always, please note that this meeting is being recorded and is under the umbrella of the Hyperledger Foundation. So we ask that everyone abide by the antitrust policy that we're sharing and the code of conduct. The antitrust policy states that we avoid discussions of specific pricing products and projects. We don't make negative remarks about other companies or products. And the code of conduct means that we treat each other with respect, never discriminate and communicate constructively. We fully support Hyperledger's policy of openness, equity, and inclusion. And for new participants, uh, welcome. And if you'd like, please introduce yourself in the chat. And if there's anything specific or any areas of interest, please include that in the chat and we'll definitely try to include the in the discussion. We like to make these meetings as interactive as possible. Here's our agenda for today. <clears throat> Excuse me, James Hendrick will provide an update on developments in the mortgage industry, and we'll discuss AI and blockchain in the mortgage industry. In May, we had an introduction to these topics. Then in June, we had Devin Daly, the Chief Revenue Officer from True, and we delved deeper into it. Today, we have Sanjay Kumar Nishog, the COO from Intain, and he's going to be uh, going deeper into their products and, and into this project. Uh, area as well. And it, we will also have uh, Mark D'Angelo uh, speaking about his latest publication as well. We had not had a chance to add that to the agenda. Okay. We always cover the slide in each of our meetings, and, and this is to reinforce that we're all on the same blockchain journey, but we may be at different points along that path. For today's topic of AI and blockchain, this is particularly applicable since we're all still learning uh, about AI and blockchain. And today's sessions and the ongoing sessions will really focus on education. We want to educate everyone within the mortgage industry about the possibilities of AI and blockchain and to demonstrate the feasibility of both technologies using mortgage industry use cases and define potential implementation paths for the mortgage industry. Okay, um, I'm just going to go through the next three slides very quickly. Uh, for those of you that are new to the group or would like more information, this slides provide different uh, resources. I'm not gonna go through all of those, but we do highlight the second ones from the bottom. That's the link to our Hyperledger Wiki, and we'll go into that in, in a bit more detail. That mortgage subgroup link contains the meeting notes for our group, recordings from previous sessions, and curated articles in the mortgage industry. These are great resources and we offer them up to you guys to, to get more educated and to learn a bit more as well. So to access the resources, you will need an LFID. I'm not gonna go into how to get those, but this slides gives you that information and all of this is free. In addition to getting that LFID, this is our blockchain training slide. This is how I got up to speed in blockchain. This is free training that's offered by the Hyperledger Foundation, and I highly encourage you to uh, use these resources. Okay, with that, I will turn it over to Mr. James Hendrick, and he'll walk us through the state of blockchain. Marvin, thank you very much and welcome everybody. Um, let's go ahead and jump into the first slide. <clears throat> so, you know, we're always trying to mix up the information that we give to you guys. Actually, back up one, Marvin. Sorry. There we go. Yeah, we're always trying to mix up, you know, the information and communications we're getting to use. So this first link that we're um, highlighting is actually from CNBC. It's a video. Jenny Johnson is the CEO of Franklin Templeton Investments. She talks about the two biggest uh, disruptors that we're beginning to see in any industry, and those are blockchain and AI. And we're hearing this message pretty prevalent out there. She also goes on to state that Bitcoin is the greatest distraction 
from the greatest disruption, which I thought was a pretty interesting quote. Um, she's not saying that Bitcoin has no value, but she really focuses on how blockchain allows a payment method, smart contracts, and a general ledger to provide a single source of truth. Um, she comments on how big banks, for the most part, still rely on large batch processing overnight. And by having a single source of truth, it drives down costs. Um, and then she goes on to discuss different case studies in various industries. So if you're looking for bite-sized information, this is great. It's about a five-minute video. In addition, CNBC's done a great job of including other videos on the side that all relate to blockchain and AI. And most of them are in uh, five to 10-minute segments, so they're you know very easy to consume. You know, I also wanted to talk a little bit about uh, crypto and the crypto mortgages. It's been a while since we've actually touched bases on this one. This next article came out of the National Mortgage News. And really what it was talking about is despite, you know, criticism and controversies, talk of regulation, cryptocurrency doesn't appear to be going anywhere. You know, we've had a big mantra that crypto is not blockchain. It's just a, you know, application running on top of a, um, uh, you know, very valuable um, underlying resource of blockchain. Um, what is still uncertain is where crypto will wind up landing in the mortgage ecosystem. So in previous presentations, we've reported on various mortgage institutions that have released crypto mortgage products, so such as Milo Credit and Moon Mortgage. This article covers those as well, and we actually have links in the wiki and our archive that can take you to information on both of those companies. Some of them are still generating loans, while numerous entities actually decided to reverse course. But for the time being, the article discusses the role of crypto in home finance, really looks like it's becoming a specialized niche um, geared towards investment purchases. GSEs have expressed limited willingness to improve or move the needle in these cases, and policies still prohibit consideration of crypto income in the underwriting process. In addition, there's consumers' limited understanding of how the volatile asset can be used in the origination process. So advocates of crypto, of crypto, they're not deterred by headlines such as the bankruptcies of exchanges like Celsius Networks and FTX or the wild swings of the asset take. For these customers, volatility might actually be the draw to these type of products. So Milo uh, Credit CEO, Jocelyn Rupina, she's quoted as saying, um, most of our clients that are in the crypto mortgage side tend to be more affluent from a crypto network perspective. So, you know, more to come. We'll continue to see how crypto plays in the market. But again, right now, it's seeming like it's uh, really associated with those that are looking to make investment opportunities and are knowledgeable in the crypto space. Um, Marvin, let's go ahead and move on to the next one. So Bank of America is speculating a significant transformation over the next decade, fueled by the development of blockchain and asset tokenizations. Specifically, the bank points to private permission, distributed ledgers, and blockchain subnets as the key enablers for this transformation. Tokenization of traditional finan financial assets, you know, basically the digitizing of assets and representing them as tokens on a blockchain, is projected to revolutionize how these assets are issued and transferred, effectively reducing costs and inefficiencies while increasing transparency and security amongst all parties. So the, the bank highlights a crucial point in this article that despite the current regulator, regulatory turbulence in the crypto market, it's important to maintain sight of the ongoing technological revolution beneath the surface with this underlying technology. So great article to see what you know some of the big banks are looking at and uh, how they are evaluating blockchain. And then the last article we've got on this slide, um, Mark D'Angelo has been writing a series um, in AI. Um, we've actually got him here in attendance. I'm going to turn it over to him because he can do a much better job of summarizing it than I would ever be able to do. Well, I'm not sure about that, James. You are very eloquent on this. But uh, I started writing this series. This is actually a four-part series. Part one was released in um, May of this year. 
And it's really focusing not just on the AI technology, we discussed that, but what about the organization? What about the culture? What about the consumer? And that's often what we forget about in our quest for AI, the technology, you know, generative AI, what, what have you. And what you have on this diagram on here on page 11 is really the major boxes, you know, and, and, and again, in the old world of uh, paper-based IT automation, we used to look at people, process, and technology. I kind of took that in a different viewpoint and said, what about customer? What about the industry? And what about the changing ecosystem that everybody participates in? Because that ecosystem is very different than the traditional financial approach, and especially within the mortgage arena, how that's all changing and becoming more digitally native versus digitized uh, of an automated paper process. And so that's what that diagram is. And the four part series, basically then uh, part one is kind of the, the general overview, looking at the various high level value chains from a consumer point of view. And then part two focuses strictly on the consumer. Part three focuses on the industry and that came out here in July. And, and part four is coming up here the 1st of August. Uh, we'll talk about the ecosystem and, and you can look at all the pressure points. And, and if we look at AI strictly, I think it's from an industry standpoint, be you in the mortgage or be you in retail financial, if we look at it just from the uh, technology standpoint or the, you know, just automating the data, ingesting that information, then I think we fail. Uh, it would be much uh, analogous to the, the cyber currency. You know, we, we can go down that path, we can chase a shiny object, but if we don't understand how it impacts our consumer, then I think we have a, a real issue. Uh, and actually, we, we brought the mortgage bankers uh, in to talk about this in uh, June. Part of my role is also I am the associate director for X Labs, which is part of Case Western Reserve University, the Weatherhead School of Management. And, and we brought the chief legal counsel from the NBA and we brought Thomson Reuters in uh, and we brought a AI focused um, uh, consumer investing uh, startup in as well. And those are available if you want to look at the recordings, they're available through my LinkedIn website, you can find these articles and, and what have you. But it was very telling because when we started talking to the MBA specifically on AI and inclusion, you know, the pages are being written. And I think that's the message is that if we look at this from a consumer standpoint versus a technological standpoint, and oftentimes we talk about skills and what have you, uh, the idea of... Um, Ensemble learning, basically AI talking to other AI systems and the impacts, let's say, on the mortgage processes themselves, the 80-some processes that exist within the industry. That is a different ordeal, a different set of processes, a different customer focus, because what happens when AI gets it wrong? What does that do to your brand? What does that do to the products that you're offering? What does it do to the downstream uh, effects of securitization and even servicing? So these are the types of things we're, we're talking about. And I think Marvin's telling me to get the hell off the stage. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but that's really what this whole article series is looking at it from a different viewpoint, asking different questions and trying to say not one size fits all. Mark. Yeah. That, that, thank you, Mark. I, that was not a hint for you to get off the stage. There was a siren <laughs> driving by. I was trying to hit mute, but yeah. my fat fingers hit the wrong button. Well, and if you're really interested in this, there's a different, uh, I'm, I'm releasing a different series, another four-part series that's coming out on Reuters Media uh, here this the end of this month. Uh, Thomson Reuters Institute will actually be part of their think tank. And, and this will actually then be backed up. It's not AI, this specific thing again, but it's AI enabled regulatory technology. So we're taking a specific reg tech implication and we're bringing in noted leaders from some small names like KPMG and Grant Thornton from the accounting and tax side. So we're looking at it from the transparency, the repeatability, the auditability of this. And so uh, continuing on this vein, you'll see more of this from me uh, in the future months. Mark, thank you very much. Um, I personally, I loved how part one addresses it from a consumer point of view. Um, you get very in-depth. I love your writing style. You're very in-depth in your detail, but you do a fantastic job of summarizing. I'm actually in the midst of digesting your uh, part three right now. Um, <laughs> when can the readers actually expect part four to the series? Part four will be out the first week of August. Uh, it is the final touches. It'll go into the uh, the editors over at the MBA. 
um, uh, probably last week of this month, and then it gets into the cycle for print. You can also find these articles, like I said, on the XLab Case Western site. They are replicated there as well. Uh, and part four will show up probably about the same time uh, as the MBA. So we, we do do release to try to get as, uh, as much eyeballs and much comments and thoughts uh, as we can across the industries. Fantastic. Thank you for joining us today, Mark and Sharon. I appreciate it. Marvin, uh, next slide. All right. And yesterday, Marvin and Pavan Ardawal, CEO of SunWest Mortgage, held a discussion on AI and blockchain in the real estate industry. Um, and Marvin, I'm actually going to pass it over to you. Uh, thanks, James. Th this was a, a really interesting and exciting session with Pavan. He he's a person that I have a, a lot of respect for. The the man Pavan is really doing with AI and blockchain what we've all talking about making the two work together and providing a seamless and you converting it into what he calls empathetic technology that tries to uh, interact with the consumer in a more empathetic fashion so that it's not as as automated or as dry as what we would expect. He walked the, I gave him an overview of AI blockchain and real estate, and then he spent half the call going through a demo of their application called Angel AI. I highly encourage you guys to take a look at it. It, it really hints as to what is possible with the technology. Um, and we'll provide a link to that as well. It, I really enjoyed speaking with him and speaking with the audience. Fantastic, Marvin. Thanks. It, it actually was a great pre presentation. It was very entertaining. And yes, I did uh, <laughs> guess the correct um, uh, Wonder Woman article that uh, Pavan was looking for. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay, great. I don't want to give it away to the group. We'll let okay. watch it in the video. Um, moving on to the next slide, Marvin. So you, just as a reminder, this is our wiki page for the mortgage industry subgroup. Um, we've been doing these presentations. We're actually coming up pretty close to a two-year anniversary in about November. Um, so if you'd like to see any of our previous presentations, over on the left-hand side, you'll find links to the recordings for those, as well as the actual presentation themselves. Um, over on the right-hand side, the articles that we've been talking today, um, we're curating them. We've got an archive. Over the last two years, we've gathered roughly around 200 different articles. So if you guys are looking for information for research, feel free, check out the wiki side, look on the right tab here, go over to the uh, archived articles on the left side. Um, as Marvin mentioned, you know, please set up an LFID. It's free. Um, and by registering with our mortgage industry subgroup, you'll be getting automated announcements when the meetings are occurring, when we're posting new articles, things of that nature. So uh, Alma was kind enough to drop the link below into the chat. Go ahead and click on that link and save it as a favorite. And Marvin, I'm going to pass it over to you to introduce our guest speaker. Thank you, James. Um, always great information. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce Sanjay Kumar Nishank, the Chief Operations Officer at Intain. Um, Sanjay has co-founded two fintech startups. He's delivered multiple digital transformation rollouts of enterprise platforms, across the world in do the domains of capital markets, mortgage, retail banking, and investment banking. And over the last three years, he's developed a deep hands-on expertise and provided services around uh, technology, blockchain, AI, consulting, design solution, training, and different POC use case implementation. So uh, he is very knowledgeable in this area, and we're very thankful and appreciative to have him here and to share his knowledge. So uh, welcome, Sanjay. Thank you. Thank you, Marvin. Uh, it's great to be uh, great to be here in this platform talking about what we have been doing for the last four or five months, uh, four or five years. Um, now, as you uh, I mean, thank you for the introduction as well. Uh, so we actually, so before I go on to, uh, if I can share my screen, um, and then I'll probably I will get stop started sharing, and you should be able to share.
All right. So before I start talking about what we have been doing uh, in the conversing area of AI and blockchain with Intain, probably uh, I'll just take half a minute to introduce our company, Intain FT. Uh, was set up around uh, April 2018 when we started, uh, when I and Siddharth, the other co-founder, uh, joined hands to set up a company where we thought that, uh, and both of us, where we thought that uh, using both of the blockchain and AI technologies, we can actually build something um, for an industry which we have been working on for a pretty long time. So I have uh, I have close to around uh, around seven or eight years of experience in the mortgage industry before I started this company. Siddharth was uh, uh, Siddharth was uh, respond. Um, Siddharth was the CEO of one of the uh, large ops group of a of a of a large bank based out of India. So we we thought that uh, blockchain and AI technologies can be used to solve quite a few problems of this industry. Uh, so that's that's where we started in TAIN uh, in, uh, in April 2018. Uh, in the last four or five years, we have developed three products. Uh, uh, we started with developing the first product, which was Intent Admin. Um, uh, for, for that product, what we intended to do is, uh, is that, uh, we actually tried to get the complete workflow of a uh, of a mortgage life cycle uh, and build uh, uh, build flows on that backed by hyperledger fabric platform um once we did uh, once we developed that product we we took around um, we took around a year to develop that product so we actually went to market around uh, August or September of 2019, when we reached out to the large trustees, because uh, we thought that um, you know such a product can be pretty acceptable or can be sold to um, sold to some of the anchor players in the industry. So um, as far as smart case uh, industry is concerned, trustee. Uh, um, uh, trustee is uh, is an entity which actually plays an anchor role in the overall life cycle. So we reached out to quite a few large trustees. Uh, we were able to reach out to um, you know two of the top ten uh, trustees in the U.S. Um, who were uh, ready to use our product. But uh, uh, but since these are all pretty uh, large organizations and mortgage industry is pretty age old and uh, it's it's a pretty old industry, uh, so they they wanted to use only the investor reporting and analytics features of our product and that's where we got started. So um, so that that was the first product which we actually put into production. Like I said, we act, uh, so those uh, uh, those trustees actually started using our product around December 2019 for uh, for investor reporting and analytics in their production environments. Um, once they did that, then we kept building on the top of that. Uh, we started realizing certain other issues which we could have uh, which we could handle using our platform, and then we kept building on that. So as I go through the presentations now, uh, presentation now, I'll I'll probably talk about how we started and what we kept uh, kept adding to that. And uh, uh, since the beginning, like I said, you know, both of uh, both of us, both the co-founders of Intain, since we came from the industry, we actually spent decent amount of around twenty years in terms of providing and uh, deploying enterprise-wide applications uh, for the financial services industry. So we always started from the context of what is the business problem and and uh, and, and what can we do to uh, to provide a solution to that rather than actually trying to figure out that hey we wanted to do something with blockchain or AI um, and that's why we uh, we actually had one product and then we kept building uh, we kept talking to the client and we got some feedback and then we kept building on that and based on that we have uh, we have now three different versions of the product. Um, uh, to the extent that the last product, the version that we built, we are actually launching that as completely a new, uh, completely a different product. So, um, if I can go through, uh, if I can go through uh, my presentations now. Uh, now, obviously, we know that uh, you know. Um, uh, so, the, so the initial problem statement was that there is huge amount of money which is being spent by the finance, uh, by the structured finance industry. Um, on the intermediation, on the transaction, exp uh, and the transaction expenses, which are which were primarily being done using Excel sheets and emails. 
and as we know there are there are close to 12 or 13 entities for a typical uh, structured finance life cycle um uh, which actually get involved in, uh, in taking the assets uh, right from the origination stage till the time that uh, those assets gets converted into uh, some structured finance instruments they get advanced and uh, they get sold out to the investors and then uh, month after month um, in some periodic intervals uh, the services keep getting that uh, keep uh, you know keep collecting the uh, the installments and then uh, um, and then the interest or coupon uh, rates usually being passed on to investors. So there are uh, there are you know close to twelve or thirteen entities. Uh, it usually takes a uh, it takes a decent amount of time. Um, and since there are so many number of entities, there are uh, multiple systems which are being involved by individual entities in terms of maintaining data, in terms of passing in data between different uh, different players. Um, because of all of this, uh, but the, usually, uh, you know, when we actually get to a structured finance industry, the minimum deal size, which uh, which gets uh, structured, um, has certain thresholds. So, which uh, so which is around hundred million dollars. Cost of transaction uh, is around one or two million, and uh, the transaction itself gets around uh, takes around eight to twelve weeks to completely consume it, and. Uh, and the status reporting, whereas the investors would probably want the status uh, status of each one of those transits or each one of those investments to be reported to them on an online basis, but it never happens. Uh, even after being, uh, even after uh, uh, the installments being collected by the services, uh, the trustee usually takes around three to seven weeks to report on them to the investors. Uh, essentially, the problem statement that we started working with is that we wanted to uh, reduce that uh, deal size, which can be um, which can be uh, which can be issued using a platform to around eight to ten million. Um, uh, the cost of transaction should be should uh, similarly come down, and the transaction timeline can actually be uh, can that actually be reduced, even if. Uh, uh, we will not be able to reduce the uh, the use of Excel, email, and the coordination between different entities, let's say between servicer or uh, between servicer and the issuer or servicer and the trustee, we should be able to reduce the timeline. So that was our initial uh, thought process based on which we wanted to build this platform. Uh, so like I said, we actually started work working on this product uh, in December 2018, um, sorry, April 2018, and we had a uh, workable version of this product, which we called Intern Admin Flow. Uh, we actually renamed this product at that time. We actually called it just Intern Admin. Um, uh, in production, uh, we had Intern Admin Flow in production around uh, December 19. And then uh, uh, when we took it to the trustees, uh, then there are a couple of other issues that they face. So Intern Admin Flow just it it encompassed only uh, only the uh, only the life cycle where we could take the deals we could and then we could uh, we could onboard the assets uh, meaning the loans um, and then we could uh, allow we would allow the trustee uh, to set up the deal we would allow the servicer to get the um, get the monthly information on each one of those loans into our platform and uh, we would allow the trustee to uh, generate the investor report and share it to the investor. So that's that was the scope of intern admin. But then we realized that before uh, before uh, the servicer, uh, uh, before the trustee usually onboards the deal, they also wanted to do the due diligence of the individual loans. So if there are let's say multiple loans which is part of a single deal, they wanted to do the due diligence of that loan. So we built another AI uh, AI component so that uh, um, that can be used by the trustee to do do the reconciliation to uh, to do the digitization of the document, do the reconciliation, and then onboard those loans onto the platform. So that was one component that we added where we used AI. Uh, so that's that's part of IAH, and uh, the second component that we also added there is uh, is is on the loan tip cracker because uh, usually the trustees work with multiple services, mul uh, different services maintain their loan tapes in different sort of formats, but uh, once they get in uh, get all of those um, all of those loan tips into our platform, unless they are completely standardized. 
it's pretty difficult to uh, to actually extract those information from the loan contracts firstly and secondly uh, to actually aggregate all of that data into a single uh, report and share that you know, with the investors because investors obviously don't care you know where uh, the loans are getting originated or how many services are servicing the loan so that's a second component which we added. Uh, so that these two components uh, are being added to IA flow uh, to uh, to form IAS. Uh, then to IAS, then we again realize that uh, you know once we have all of these loans, unless we tokenize, the liquidity part is missing. So the tokenization part is what we added to IAS to form uh, to form a product called LinkedIn Markets. Um, uh, so these are three. Basically, these are three evolutions of the product that we have had in the last three and four years. And like I said, we always just, uh, we started with Intent IA flow, uh, where we started to solve a business problem. Then we uh, we took that to the market. Uh, the trustees started talking to us about something else. And then we added a couple of more uh, components to that. And uh, finally, Intel Markets. Um, so in terms of, uh, in term, uh, so uh, as far as Intent Admin is concerned, which is the uh, which is the platform which we have actually built using Hyperledger Fabric, so that saw quite a bit of traction as as we can see uh, from this diagram above. So we um, at the end of uh, twenty two we were managing around six billion dollars of structured finance instruments using our platform. Uh, and which was being used by uh, a top two trustees, uh, you know, two of the uh, largest 10 trustees in the US. So we are managing around $6 billion of structured finance teams on our platform. Um, now, uh, this, this diagram essentially just, uh, you know, simply talks about um, how this intern admin uh, takes care of different entities and how the pools are formed. But, uh, but I'll, I'll actually go through this as part of uh, some of the demo that I have, uh, which will be coming. Um, the other important part uh, about Intent Admin uh, is also uh, the fact that uh, using an Intent Admin, uh, we have been able to allow the trustee to codify the, uh, the payment waterfall rules, uh, which are essentially coming from the indenture documents. So the trustee usually um, uh, can can code all of, all of those using a uh, chain codes. Uh, so we use uh, so we have close to seventy five or eighty chain codes which we have built over the last four or five years uh, to to cater to uh, payment waterfall calculations across different asset classes, uh, asset classes uh, including residential real estate, commercial real estate, and some of the ABS deals. Um, now, like I said, Intel Admin Edge IAS essentially adds this uh, three components to Intel Admin Flow. The uh, one of them is this automation of uh, contract verification, which is it, uh, which is a typical function which is being um, executed by a verification agent in the in the overall uh, you know fin uh, structured finance lifecycle. The uh, the second one is this payment waterfall uh, automation and loan tracks, where uh, usually the trustee or the investor usually demands, as far as as far as a particular transaction is concerned, uh, you know, which are the different states from from which loans are coming in, what kind of FICO scores uh, people have, the borrowers have in terms of the underlying loans, how many you know in terms of delinquency status and and all of that. Um, and of course, uh, the third component that we have added in Intel Admin is as compared to IA flow is the services summary. Um, so, uh, so essentially what we have tried to do is uh, the integ overall integrated platform can actually be used uh, by a verification agent for due diligence of the loan documents. And this is where essentially we use the AI component uh, to do the DD of uh, underlying loan documents. Um, service of loan tape standardization, which is being done by Loan Tape Cracker, uh, we actually use uh, 2019. Um, we use the SMA standards, which were issued in 2019, in terms of standardizing the loan tapes. Once those loan tapes have been uploaded by the servicer, data modeling and payment waterfall, which is uh, which is a typical function being undertaken by the paying agent. And like I said. Uh, you know, these are being done using uh, chain codes uh, in the hyperledger fabric environment. 
uh, loan strats uh, and portfolio insights uh, we have uh, we use another another tool to provide the loan stratifications and portfolio in insights as far as uh, a particular deal deal is concerned or the different branches of the deals are concerned and of course you know based on all of this we we would definitely um, as of now we do not have any rating agencies as part of any of the platforms but then we actually uh, have that uh, capability to allow the rating agencies to go through all of these loans, uh, all of the loans and assets. Um, uh, now these are some of those screenshots, but then we'll, uh, we'll go through the actual demo and, we, uh, and then we can go through this. Uh, the first one is, uh, so this is a verification agent uh, screenshot uh, where somebody can, uh, the verification agent, the VA can actually go through the digitized loan contract document and then see where there is a match or mismatch as far as the data between the contract document and the LMS or the loan management system data is concerned. And then he can make the, uh, he can actually do the reconciliation and uh, enter the edited data into, into our platform. Load tip cracker, uh, we are based on the asset class and based on the data which is extracted uh, from, the, uh, from the LMS data, which is uploaded by a servicer we and uh, we actually provide the standard uh, loan tape names uh, but of course it's up to uh, it's up to the trustee uh, or the servicer uh, to make all of those changes to those standard fields um, now I'll, I'll go through this as part of the demo. Um, uh, now this, this screenshot just essentially talks about what kind of stratification or asset level analytics that a loan data is and can actually uh, view as part of the platform. Uh, this is also another screen which essentially talks about the payment waterfall calculations for a specific deal, uh, which is being done by paying agent. Um, okay. Um, um, now, like, uh, like I said, uh, so the third uh, third product that we are currently um, working on is adding the token adjacent component to this uh, overall internet admin platform so that once we have all of these uh, instruments, structured finance instruments, they are on our platform and the services are uh, reporting, um, the trustee is reporting on those uh, assets, uh, on those instruments month and month to different investors to provide liquidity uh, to those instruments. Uh, we, will, uh, we will build some additional uh, process flows. We will build uh, some additional components so that those individual instruments can actually be tokenized and uh, they will have some value. So um, now essentially Intent Markets is a platform which we are trying to build using Avalanche and uh, not Hyperledge of Fabric as of now. So, so that's a uh, that's that's a little different system that we are currently building. Now, um, uh, yeah, I mean, there are uh, these are all some of the benefits. Uh, you know, one of the important uh, benefit is that uh, uh, is the first point, which is we have uh, you know since the in the last three or four years we have been trying to build a digital solution, not you know uh, just, just talking about uh, using a blockchain technology to form the solution, but a digital solution and automated solution. So for that automated solution, whatever is required is what we have tried to build. And so initially we thought that unless we get all of these assets. Um, into the platform, nobody is going to actually trust the quality of this assets. So, which is why we got all of those assets into the, uh, into the platform and save those into the blockchain. But then we realized that um, unless somebody can actually verify those assets, there is no point in getting all of those assets from an Excel sheet into a blockchain. And that's where we started building the AI solution. So, so the important part is it's a digital solution, not necessarily a blockchain solution. Uh, so, the, so these are these are some of the benefits that uh, that we have been talking to our clients, and which is uh, which is kind of appreciated uh, uh, by the clients, and um, and this is why we have uh, two of our, two of the top ten trustees uh, using our platform, you know, uh, for the last two and a half years now. Um, okay, um, so I think uh, at this point. Um, I can probably stop for a bit um, and then I can move on to uh, do 
a brief demo of uh, two of the platforms. So uh, the first demo that we, I will do, I'll actually go through the intent admin um, demo, uh, which will just, just essentially talk about the overall process flow and how it goes. So that can give a view to people about, uh, um, about how it works. And the second demo, I'll just talk about uh, which, which, is this, uh, which is the process flow step where uh, we actually use the AI component. So I can, uh, so I can take some questions right now if people have some something to ask. Otherwise, I, I'll just uh, start with the demo. Uh, uh, hi, Sanjay. I, I don't have a question, but I do have a comment. Just the very last bullet that you have on this slide, taking a plumber-like approach to building those technology components. I think that's exactly what's needed within the financial services industry, specifically mortgage because that's what blockchain is intended to do, or, or that's where it's best utilized. It provides the pipes for mortgages and the uh, that asset-related information to be funneled be between different entities. So I, I love the way that you worded it, and, and I love the analogy that you provide there. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and uh, as a matter of fact, Actually, you know, nobody, when we talk to the clients and even the new clients, nobody, uh, you know, people were probably enthused with blockchain technologies. Uh, you know, I have been, uh, I have been, uh, you know, kind of working with blockchain technologies since uh, 2017. At that point in time, people were pretty fascinated with all this. But uh, in the last, uh, what I've seen is in the last two years, nobody actually cares whether you use a blockchain technology. But um, if you actually give a solution uh, with the fact that, uh, hey, I am also using blockchain technologies for non repudiation tamper proof, and uh, a golden source of truth, then probably that's what uh, strikes with most of the most of that. Okay, um, so uh, so this is uh, uh, now this is the it's a pre recorded demo. So I'll just go through this and uh, um, I'll probably talk uh, and talk through uh, the, uh, the demo. So this is essentially um, uh, the intent admin uh, intent admin flow. So where uh, so I have already logged in as a trustee. As a trustee, I will have uh, um, so I will have all of these different options. It's a dashboard of a trustee where. Uh, I can I can add new report. I can uh, I can get a service of data from the from the store and. Uh, uh, and uh, so, so there are two parts. As I said, uh, again, uh, probably I can stop uh, stop a bit here. So in intent admin, we actually once we get the data from servicer, we uh, we save that. Uh, initially, we actually save that into a MongoDB as an intermediary database. Um, and then once all the data has already been verified uh, in terms of the services summary by the trustee, then we uh, take that data back to uh, back to blockchain. And this we have done consciously because we know that uh, you know um, um, uh, in in the current system, most of the issuers uh, or or the trustee would have the data existing in some kind of platform or in some uh, some way. But then we cannot just take that data as is and then allow those uh, to be saved into blockchain because as we know you know once it goes into blockchain we cannot make some changes uh, we can uh, we can't delete that so so that way we we actually use some intermediary database which is a mongodb and that's where uh, uh, so we get the data first into a database and then uh, then to a um, and then to blockchain um Okay, uh, so essentially what we do is uh, the trustee has to set up a deal. Uh, so there are some uh, there are some static fields, there are some dynamic fields. So in this uh, in this demo, so we are showing as to you know how many trances are there for that particular uh, for that uh, particular structured finance deal. Um, you know how many uh, uh, you know how many nodes are there, how many node types are there. Once we set that, once we set up the deal, um, then for a particular deal for a month and year, uh, we actually choose the uh, uh, we actually choose the LMS uh, Excel sheet, uh, uh, you know, which will tell us about all the loan data uh, that I'm going to use as part of this deal. So, um, so that's what I will, uh, as, as a trustee, I'm going to, I'm going to get all of this, all of this data, LMS data into my system. 
Uh, so these are all individual loan related data. So I'm going to first onboard those into, into the platform. Um, and I'm going to onboard that based on a particular deal name and month and year. Once I, uh, so this is where, uh, once I do that, uh, you know, based on based on the logic that we have built as part of, part of the platform and based on the header names of that LMS uh, LMS data sheet, uh, LMS data Excel, we are going to provide some uh, standard field names which we have already defined. And like I said, all these standard field names uh, we have actually taken out of the SMAS standards, 2019 SMAS standards. We, we wanted to follow certain standards um, based on which we are going to uh, derive the investor reports. Uh, so it's it's going to, the system is going to give all of those uh, wherever uh, it actually finds a match uh, between the header names of the LMS Excel sheet and uh, the standard fields which have already been defined. Uh, it's going to, uh, uh, it's going to give you a match. Otherwise, uh, the user can actually add uh, some of the additional standard fields also. Uh, I, I'm sorry, Sanjay, uh, should we be looking at the demo now because we're still looking at the slide? Okay, sorry, sorry about that. Um, I'm really sorry. Uh, but, uh, let me just, uh, let me just reshare my screen. Okay. Okay, now we're at the add a new report screen yes, yes. in Intain Admin. Is that the start of the demo? Okay. Um, the, uh, so let me, so with whatever I have already mentioned uh, since I was not able to share it. So let me just quickly in a half a minute, let me just go through this. So this is the trusty dashboard. Um, so in the trusty dashboard, um, the trustee can actually add report and uh, uh, it, it can actually define the report. It can upload the servicer data and that servicer data gets saved into MongoDB and from MongoDB it gets saved into, saved into blockchain. Uh, that's what I mentioned. So this is the dashboard for the servicer. Uh, I'm sorry, for the trustee. Um, and now we'll, we'll probably go through this uh, demo. Uh, all right, uh, so we're just trying to show uh, what all uh, the trustee can do as part of the dashboard. Um, uh, when we say view service data from the network, we mean the blockchain network, otherwise it's on the database. Um, so uh, before the trustee can do anything, he has to set up the um, set up the deal and that's where you know there are some static fields there are some dynamic fields so he has to keep adding all of this information uh, first to set up the deal so this is the setup phase and most of this uh, most of this information actually comes from the pre-placement memorandum of the deal once it's set up then uh, uh, the trustee usually selects the uh, deal name, month, year, and then the LMS data or uh, the actual underlying assets data file uh, from his own systems. Um, because uh, so that uh, as as part of the onboarding stage. So this is the Excel sheet that we are trying to onboard. So this has the list of all the all the underlying loan assets which has to be uh, uploaded and which will be included as part of the deal. Uh, once it's uploaded, then we need to standardize. Like I said, we use 2019 SMA standards to standardize the uh, standardize the uh, loan tape. Um, uh, once we standardize, we can actually save it. And when we save it, it actually gets saved into MongoDB. Like I said, the first, uh, in the first iteration, it gets saved into MongoDB. Um, now, as far as the, once we get the LMS data or the underlying asset data onboarded into the system, then uh, uh, we can actually, 
uh, we, uh, we can uh, get the mapping and then change all the mapping if, if we want um, any of the standard fields which has been suggested by the system or by the platform is not acceptable to the or is not the right one as uh, um, you know as uh, as defined by the trustee then uh, we can actually make changes based on that we will get a servicer uh, loan summary so essentially uh, this is where uh, we actually uh, first do a bit of calculation to show uh to show the servicer of, so in this case trustee is actually acting on behalf of the servicer so once uh, we show all of this uh, all of this services summary if that's all looks fine to the trustee then uh, then he can actually onboard the complete data to the network and if there are certain other information that he wants to include then obviously you know he can enter all those details Uh, so at this point, once all of the service data is generated, service summary data is generated, then the trustee report, uh, which is usually mandated in the in the PPM, so he has to generate the trustee report, uh, and he also has to uh, define which of the investors he has to share these details with. So that's where he gives all the investor details uh, to whom uh, these reports are going to be distributed. If there are some other changes that he needs to do, uh, do all of these changes. So, so this is another section where we actually allow the trustee to customize the report and then add the different sections to the report. We have seen that uh, different trustees have um, different uh, sections in the report that they want to have as part of the phase one or phase two or phase three. So uh, this is also another flexibility or configurability that we are providing um, as, part of, uh, as part of this report generation. So once uh, once all that is being saved and customized, then the trustee can actually um, see the actual report, how it looks like, and um, and once if and and like I said, you know all of this uh, all of these details that um, all of this concentration limit or all of the payment waterfall calculations at this point usually get uh, gets calculated using those uh, chain code libraries that we have built over a period of time so there are around 70 chain code uh, chain codes that we have built for different kind of assets for di different kind of trading uh, uh, for different kind of trigger events um, so which actually give give out all of these numbers so as of now all of this data is being retrieved uh, from the from the ledger uh, from the hyperledger fabric ledger uh, once the trustee is satisfied, then he's going to publish this report. And uh, when he actually publishes this report, this report gets available to the uh, to the investors that he wants uh, this report to be published, or as he had defined uh, in the uh, generate trustee report section. So I, as a trustee, since you guys are are using chain code to calculate the interest payments uh, and then all of that lives on the blockchain, I can go ahead and see uh, the calculation formula uh, for my portfolio. All of that is, is public on the yes. blockchain. Okay. Yes, yes. And at the same time, it can also be yeah, downloaded. So we uh, we understand that quite a few trustees uh, and investors actually work in a PDF mode even now. So yep. we have been um, you know, facing issues in terms of bringing people onto our platform. So we have given the choice of downloading all of this in a PDF format and then uh, looking at all that data.
So the second part is about uh, um, so this is the monthly trustee report, uh, which is uh, generated by the trustee. Now, the second part is about this loan strat analytics. Um, so which is an ad hoc way of uh, actually, you know, giving an access to the investor and to the trustee to slice and dice on the data that we have already collected uh, from the LMS uh, Excel. So where for a particular deal, uh, we can actually do the slicing and dicing based on principal balance, average loan uh, size, um, different states, FICO scores, delinquency status, uh, wax, uh, weighted average, LTV, uh, CDRs and CPRs, um, and all of that. Uh, so this is an ad hoc section where uh, any investor or any trustee can actually make changes uh, to any of the uh, to any of the parameters and based on what parameters they want to uh, see the data. Yeah, I, I really like this uh, reporting insights page. So is there a drill down capability? So because I understand that this is all at the portfolio level, if I click on a portfolio, can I drill down to see what are the different assets that comprise that portfolio? Uh, yes, so there are ways in which uh, uh, in which you can actually get to the individual loan. So let's let's assume that uh, you know you saw that there are hundred loans which uh, uh, which have a FICO score between six, uh, let's say you know six hundred fifteen to six hundred twenty five. Um, you can uh, do a drill down uh, based on that. You can define the range. Um, let's say you can define the FICO range between six fifteen and six twenty, and then you can actually see the complete list of uh, loans which follow within that uh, FICO score. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's also possible. So, uh, so this is this is that section where you can actually uh, get to get to the nuts and bolts of the of the of the analytics, where you can actually do it uh, at a deal level or at a portfolio level also. So when I say portfolio, so the portfolio um, is the portfolio belonging to that particular trustee or belonging to that particular investor. So if the trustee has three deals be, uh, onboarded onto a platform, the portfolio will talk about those three deals. And yeah, in, in you can actually see all those details here. So it actually talks about uh, specifically at a loan ID level also. So if you could see. Uh, all right, so uh, so that's that's how it actually and uh, and the other thing is you can also download the map uh, LMS Excel sheet so that uh, so that you can keep it for your reference and uh, and and understand what all data has gone into the system. So uh, so this is the overall intern admin platform which can be used for the overall uh, you know end to end flow where a structured finance deal is onboarded onto the platform till the time that the reports are being generated by the trustee and published to individual investors um, month after month. So this can actually uh, work during the uh, life cycle of the of the deal. Now uh, I'll just share again. So the other part that I wanted to show is about the AI component. Right. So, so this is the this is the other part where uh, usually, like we uh, like I mentioned in the in my presentation, that the verification agent is the guy is the entity which usually uh, does all this reconciliation and due diligence. So, this is the um, this is the dashboard of the verification agent. Uh, so, it talks about the deal IDs and the asset class and who is the issuer and how many number of loans have been there as part of each of the each of the deal IDs uh, on on what date uh, uh, the uh, the deal was created. 
So, the, so uh, this is the point, uh, or this is the flow. Uh, this is the step where, uh, where the verification agent comes in as part of his dashboard once he logs into the platform. Um, as part of this, uh, he can. So this. Uh, so this is a screen which actually uh, you know drills down into the complete set of loans which was part of one particular deal so in this case there are some 1300 uh, loans which was uh, which was there as part of the platform Then lost into this, the admin of the platform can actually log into the system and then um, you know define the fields which has to be extracted out of the contract. So this contract status when it shows digitized, so meaning those particular uh, fields uh, have been extracted from the contract and the contract has been digitized. And LMS data status, it's it's Excel sheet which has been uploaded. Now, um, uh, so this, uh, all this, so there are uh, specific loan IDs which are being assigned to individual loans. So there are, as we can see, there are some 1300 loans as part of this deal. Uh, all, the, um, all the loan contract documents for those 1300 deals have already been digitized and the LMS data has been uploaded. So uh, uh, digitized using the AI, uh, AI data, AI engine. So if we can go a little further, and I can actually go into individual um, uh, individual section, individual loans, and then I can see that whether there is uh, whether uh, those five fields that I wanted to be matched between the LMS data and the contract uh, PDF document data have been matched or unmatched. That's where uh, this one, uh, you know, I can show that uh, status. I can see that status has been matched or unmatched. Now, if I want to find out what exactly, uh, you know, which are the fields that I have been, I have been trying to extract. So this is what I could see that these are the fields on the left side is what I have defined to be extracted from the loan contract document. And uh, I'm sorry, uh, the right one, which is coming from the contract document. And uh, the same fields are being extracted from the LMS Excel sheet where uh, it's uh, doing a match, uh, match or mismatch. Uh, so if I can just, uh, so I can, I can keep, uh, I, once I uh, take my focus into individual screens, then I will see what are the values. Um, so I'll keep going through um, the contract document on the, on the right side, which is the digitized contract document. And uh, it will show me uh, what values, uh, what are the corresponding values of those fields from the LMS Excel sheet. Um, Sanjay, uh, if I could just interrupt you really quickly, uh, we're two minutes over our allotted time, so I wanted to be respectful of people's time, but you've gotten to the point in the presentation that I think is unbelievably interesting. This is what a lot of people wanted to be able to see, so I, I would like you to keep going, but just to be respectful of people's time, uh, the people that have to drop off, Sanjay, could you put your contact information into the chat? So if they have to drop off, but do have questions and would like to reach out to you, that they, they'll have that in information. Um, and yeah, it, we can keep going as well, because uh, I think this is uh, really interesting and just points to the AI capability that you guys have built within the Intain product. Okay, uh, thanks, Sanjay. Yeah, uh, let's keep going for those people that can stay. And for those of you that can't, we are recording this and we'll have links available from the wiki later. Yep, thanks. Right, uh, so so as we can see, so in this, in this particular case, there was a mismatch and the contract document, uh, the monthly payment amount was 89.13, which was extracted out of the contract document, but in the LMS, uh, which was uh, which was uploaded, uh, uh, which was uploaded by the verification, um, which was uploaded by the servicer and made available to the verification agent for the due diligence was eighty nine point one four, and that's where uh, the uh, the verification agent can actually reach out uh, to the servicer and then 
and then can actually tell him that hey you know from the contract document uh, uh, which is which is kind of an old document because the contract is usually being signed by the borrowers at the at the start of uh, start of the loan cycle um, you can actually mention hey um, the updated uh, monthly payment amount is 89.14 but uh, it was mentioned as 89.13 so the servicer can actually uh, correctly advise the verification agent as to what the appropriate information, appropriate numbers are, and then he can actually make changes and do a, do a match, um, uh, which is what uh, is being allowed here. Um, and at this point, this also shows the pages being processed. So what this means is, uh, so all these seven or eight fields that we have mentioned here are, are being extracted from different places of this 13 page loan contract document um, so that's 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 what it means um, once we have that again we can also we also allow the verification agent to uh, take a download of this overall uh, re uh, overall reconciliation document where there will be um, it will actually at one point in time. So as we can see, so there are this monthly payment amount, there are quite a few differences between the um, discrepancies between the LMS uh, Excel sheet and the data extracted out of the loan contract document. That's why uh, most of them, are this, are this no and yes means uh, match or mismatch. So no meaning mismatch. So that's where, uh, that's what it uh, means. <clears throat> so for this, out of this 1300 loans, there are around um, you know, 50 or 60 loans where the monthly payment amount actually doesn't match uh, between LMS and the contract document. Uh, and then of course you know based on this excel sheet um, obviously the verification agent like i said can reach out to the servicer or to the trustee to figure out what are the actual numbers and then you can make changes um, uh, in our platform and then do a match and then uh, go ahead so that's uh, that's where the uh, due diligence actually gets completed uh, and uh, and based on this, uh, the trustee can log back into the system as I had shown in Intern Admin, um, and then uh, generate the investor report and uh, publish those report to individual investors. Uh, so that is uh, that's where uh, it kind of stops. So so um, as far as we are concerned, um, uh, you know. Uh, what we have, I probably just want to uh, want to take another half a minute uh, just to talk about what we have tried to do. Uh, where all we have tried to make some changes based on the feedback that we have received from uh, different clients over the last three or four years. So, um, and and what we have been trying to work on in the last six months or last nine months also. So as we know, when we talk about um, saving data into the blockchain, it's always uh, invoking or doing an invoke uh, invoke uh, request will always take time. Um, you know what we have seen, if uh, the number of records is more than 5,000, it takes decent amount of time to save the data into blockchain. So, uh, so, uh, so then we also started getting some kind of feedback from the client that, um, hey, it takes so much of data, and uh, you know, um, even though this actually, uh, as part of the process, usually uh, the trustees, uh, admin users do not do this uh, more than once or twice a month because these are all, uh, uh, you know, these are basically you upload the data and then you generate the report. This happens once or twice a month, unless you actually want to make some changes to that data. So, but then based on that feedback, then we actually save the data into intermediary database for some of the reports we actually wanted to. Uh, as far as the stratification reports are concerned, we, we wanted to, uh, and then we make changes so that we could generate it out of the uh, intermediary database rather than from the blockchain. So there are quite a few changes that we have done over uh, over the last nine months to uh, twelve months, and which is where uh, we, we are kind uh, kind of seeing some positive feedback uh, uh, from the from the clients now. So um, uh, apart from that, of course, um, 
um, uh, UIM UX has been extremely important uh, for individual clients, even if you have huge amount of data, unless you can give access uh, to the clients in terms of um, in terms of slicing and dicing on the data, it doesn't, uh, you know, they will keep relying on the PDF report rather than coming to your platform and starting to use a platform. So that's also something that uh, we have also seen and uh, which we are currently working on. And that's where uh, some of the other things that we want to incorporate into our platform is based on the LLM models also. So for example, let's say if I can get, um, uh, if I have all these 1300 loans, uh, loan documents, uh, loan PDF documents uh, digitized and uh, saved as part of my blockchain, uh, uh, blockchain uh, ledger, can I actually allow the users to uh, do a natural text-based uh, search for certain type of loans or from certain kind of, uh, type of counties or for certain delinquency loans? So that's uh, delinquency statuses. So I think that's uh, that's what we are also trying to work on, but that obviously is going to take some amount of time. Uh, so those are two or three areas which we are currently working on. Apart from the fact that we have already built this tokenization capability on the top of on top of this, and for which we actually used uh, Avalanche, we primarily took Avalanche because it uh, gives us a good mix of uh, private and public subnet um, out of the box, uh, which is why we did that. But uh, yeah, I mean, we uh, post all of this uh, Celsius and FTX kind of issues, uh, we have seen uh, all those discussions dragging on for quite a uh, quite a longer period of time. Um, so we uh, we have also built some off chain uh, solutions. Uh, we initially we built completely on chain solution for that, but then uh, we have started building some off chain access to that. So those uh, those are four different areas that we are currently working on as far as our products are concerned. Sanjay, I actually just had a follow-up question for you on that. I was thinking about those PDFs, the loan level contract plan. So do you guys store those on-chain or off-chain, the actual document itself? Yes. So the documents uh, are being saved into IPFS. Uh, so once we... Uh, Take the documents. Uh, usually, we allow the users, uh, uh, the clients, to um, to upload the documents to an SFTP blob store. Once they upload those documents to SFTP blob store, um, uh, and uh, we take uh, we we access those. Let's say those thirteen hundred documents. We take those into um, into our Azure file share. Uh, based on the Azure file share, we actually digitize all of those documents. So let's say each of the document has 13 pages, we digitize those. And at that point in time, we actually save those document to uh, document into private uh, IPFS cluster that we maintain uh, for each of the trustee. So yes, and uh, so that's also another important area where we are trying to uh, build something around uh, you know, which is called e -Vault. I know there are quite a few e -Vault players who actually just work in this concept of uh, providing stories for the contract documents and uh, providing security around that. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's just an extension of our product because we uh, we keep hearing about all of these uh, asks from, uh, from our clients where they say that, hey, I also have to use another e -Vault solutions because uh, because they will give me all these documents, uh, the individual documents when I need. So that's also another solution that we are trying to build and uh, integrate with our platform. Um, Sanjay, I had uh, another question that we can uh, open it up to the rest of the audience as well, because quite a few people stayed. So this was uh, very interesting. Um, you guys said that uh, you're only writing at once a month to the blockchain. And then one of the things that you guys are working on is being able to do text searches within the blockchain. So what I'm inferring from that is you guys are writing all of this information to the blockchain. It's not a hash of say a portfolio of loans. You, you're writing all of that information. Is that a correct interpretation? Yes. Um, so uh, we, we take all of this information once validated by the trustee, um, once we have given him access to make some changes, once validated, we actually save all of those into, into the blockchain. And it's not so difficult for us right now. Like I said, it's not a, 
um, it, it's not that we actually have to keep writing this multiple times and retrieving all of that data from the laser multiple times. And it's a, uh, so the trustee has to report this once in a month. So because of that, it's a little easier. I mean, at least for our use case, uh, it, um, you know, there is not so much of time pressure on this. Uh, unless it actually takes a day to save the data, so it, uh, so um, so that's why it's 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 okay. Uh, he might uh, the trustee might actually want to make some changes to the loan uh, uh, to the LMS data, but that's fine. So we uh, but end of the day we save it to uh, to the blockchain. Okay. Um, if anyone else that's still on the call has any questions, uh, please feel free. Uh, this is the Q&A portion of the presentation. I know we've gone uh, over, but uh, I did want to give everyone in the audience a, a chance to ask any questions or participate in the discussion. Okay, uh, if there aren't any other questions, uh, Sanjay, thank you very much for presenting. I think you guys have a really interesting product and, and um, that was a, a great demonstration. At this point, if you guys would like to follow up with Sanjay, he did put his information into the chat. Please feel free to reach out to him. Uh, Sanjay, again, thank you. And thank you to the Intain team for participating. I think this was a great session. Thank you. Have a great day, Thanks, everybody. Everyone. Thank you, Sanjay. Have a good day. Thank you.